so Louis Cuellar is our Clampett paper representative, and we're really happy to have him with us because uh, I've known Louis for what about eight years now? Something, uh, yeah, yeah. So a <laughs> long time, too long. Uh, and uh, uh, Louis has always been very diligent in finding what we need, finding what our customers are are, are looking for. Um, when I go to Lewis, I say, hey, Lewis, I need a paper that looks like this or like that. Um, it, he may not have it, but he goes out and looks for it. If it's out there, he finds it. And so Lewis is a Clampett paper representative. And yes, the first question I asked him is, is it like it is at, on the TV show, The Office? And, and, and <laughs> exactly. having been there, it's exactly <laughs> like that. Uh, yes. uh, one of their, their warehouses is actually uh, less than a mile away from our facility. Uh, so <laughs> I've been there a few times. Uh, uh, but anyway, he, uh, Lewis is a uh, representative with Clampett Paper. Clampett Paper is... Uh, Wholesale uh, paper merchant operating since 1941, uh, yeah, independently good. owned. I'll go to, uh, my official title is a specifications representative. So yeah. uh, as a spec rep um, for the merchant uh, distribution chain, I go out into the industry here, local market. Um, we actually have a team of seven or eight of us. Hopefully I'm not forgetting someone. Uh, throughout Texas, Oklahoma, uh, New Mexico, Kansas City and Springfield, Missouri. And then we actually just uh, acquired a new location in Denver, Colorado. So um, we're branching out, which has been excellent. Super stoked about that. Um, and definitely a great environment for art out there for sure. Uh, so I'm interested to see how that's gonna blossom out there. Yeah. But for uh, me as a specifications representative, I work with all the creatives in town on a commercial print level. Um, trying to source different papers for print projects. And outside of traditional commercial printing, um, Clampet Paper has evolved into a really great wide format uh, and uh, fine art paper resource for fine art, particularly printing and digital printing. Uh, that segment of the business has grown exponentially in the last you know, 10 to 15 years. So, um, now, now, Lewis, is it safe to say you're, you're, you're well, I, I know it's safe to say you kind of, as you're our primary annual uh, uh, distributor, or, or you're our primary annual source, um, we buy most of our annual papers from you. Um, uh, but Lewis is also, was he was partially key, he was key, I guess, in making the introductions and getting us in a place where we could uh, uh, be certified by him, you know, not only be certified, but actually have the, the uh, head of their, their marketing team come to San Antonio from Germany and visit us um, as part of, I guess you could say, that certification process. Um, and we were the first certified, they call it a certified studio, even though we're not quite a studio, but first certified uh, facility in the uh, state of Texas. Yes, yeah. Um, and I, I don't know if there's any others now, but this was about three or four years ago. But uh, uh, Lewis has been uh, really kind of leading the charge and and helping us uh, with uh, getting the Hanemiel uh, products that we need. Also, if we have issues with with a paper, uh, let's say uh, one of our customers receives a a print that they're not happy with, and they notice that, like a defect. It's rare, but it happens where where you get a you know paper that's defective, uh, uh, not necessarily with the Hanemiel, but some of the other papers. You know, we've run into that in the past, and he's been key in finding uh, and, and correcting those problems whenever we run into that. From A to Z, yeah. it's all paper, <laughs> <laughs> and, and 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 he's also good at bringing us tacos. To <laughs> it's all, right. Although as we grow, that's getting more and more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> more paper more tacos <laughs> yeah. so uh yes for sure uh at the spec rep uh, it's been great to help uh, uh finer works grow their business looking at new products uh you know being part of a, a partnership to sort of 
source uh, new uh, papers and maybe other sort of materials for uh, potential new product offerings they're developing. Um, it's always great to see that uh, James uh, here is constantly working on something new. So uh, that's excellent to, to kind of um, see firsthand and be a part of. Uh, in our general market for commercial print, you know, working with design studios and agencies and then freelancers and then the artists themselves, you know, photographers, you know, uh, watercolorists, painters, silk screeners, um, trying to provide substrates for those sort of original pieces of art. At some point, you know, digital printing comes up and fine art clay printing is a segment of that within the white format arena. So, um, and they work, the papers work very similar. Uh, sort of in a chain. So if you understand print processes from its basic form, you can sort of take that knowledge and implement it within the other forms of uh, printing on other substrates. So um, with that introduction, uh, if there's any questions about Clampit paper, for sure, I'm sure they'll send links out. You can find us on the web at clampit.com. Um, um, hopefully they'll share my email or contact information. Uh, any of the materials that I show tonight, if there's any interest in uh, picking those up, if uh, Finer Works can offer those, I can recommend things that you could do to see the materials that are printed on. And um, whether you're getting printed here through Finer Works or even smaller format on your own, we can help sort of facilitate and get the conversation going on more printing on fine art paper. So. Um, uh, anything else, James? Before I start into uh, well, just uh, uh, just a reminder to anyone: if you have, if you have questions, uh, myself or, uh, and Melissa will be monitoring the chat. Uh, we're going to try to keep everyone on mute for now. Uh, we may open it up for what people ask some questions uh, throughout the uh, uh, presentation. Uh, on YouTube, there uh, there is also an option to post questions there, and. Uh, We'll uh, interject some of these questions during the presentation. Yeah. Um, uh, at times, and Melissa will, uh, she has her list of questions too that she's going to grill. Uh oh. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Put me on the spot. Yeah. So, uh, uh, I'll go ahead and turn over to Melissa and she can take, uh, she can then set you up as the host. Here. Yeah. Okay. All right. And just as James is saying, you just go on, if you're on Zoom, make sure you just kind of hover over your screen. You'll see that chat icon down at the bottom center. Um, and I'm going to go ahead, Lewis, and I'm going to give you control now of make you the host so you can share screen and uh, all sorts of stuff there. Okay. Okay. And you now have our host of the meeting. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for everyone uh, for taking the time out to watch. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, you'll walk away with some great information tonight and um, definitely some inspiration for your uh, creativity and for, you know, your artwork and stuff. Um, just uh, bear with me. This is my first sort of co-hosted Zoom live meeting. So I'll be leaning on Melissa and James a lot for their help if there's any issues. So <laughs> uh, appreciate that. Uh, so um for some of you that have some paper knowledge or no little to no paper knowledge, uh, it's really good to understand sort of the basics, uh, sort of bring things full, full circle of how paper is manufactured, what kind of materials are sourced for those uh, papers um, in certain segments of the industry. Um, so today, since we're gonna be talking about uh, uh, fine printing art papers um, for fine art clay, um, we're going to talk about, uh, I'm going to show a little quick video, actually. I guess I'll do that now, just to sort of, it's like a minute long. There's another video I was going to try and find. Uh, I'll see if I can locate it, but if anything, we'll send you a link uh, afterwards, or they'll post a link that you can watch. Um, this clip specifically is on Hanamula Papers, and they kind of showcase, you get to see a little bit of the machinery, a little bit of the pulp, and sort of the process. So. I'm gonna go ahead and try and share my screen now and go to this right here. That one right there? The first one. The first. This one? Yeah. This yeah, one with the yeah, that's it. That one there? Oh, okay. And so 
Next one. And go ahead and make that full screen, Lewis. Okay. And I don't believe we're getting audio though. Mm. Click the, the, uh, the audio button and just drag that all the way to the right. Okay, it may not be sharing your audio. But, that, but I can, we can let you kind of describe some of what we're seeing here. That is the Hummel um, logo being embossed onto paper, correct? Yes. Yeah, so it's really more about um, the, uh, the visualness of seeing, you know, the pulp being, you know, uh, spout out into uh, the very beginning of the, uh, Paper making process, we'll just kind of look at it real quick. Uh, it's only 50 seconds. So. <laughs> and we got plenty of time here. And oh, that, that one. <laughs> and that 1584 on there that you guys are seeing is uh, its established date, correct? Yes. So Honey Mule Papers was uh, established in 1584. Um, they're the oldest uh, paper mill manufacturer in Germany. Uh, they've been creating art paper since then. It's an uh, amazing sort of history. If you take some time out a little later to visit the Hanamula website, you can check out the timeline and sort of their um, evolution of, the, of that mill and the production. Uh, and it's a really interesting sort of uh, um, look into their history. Uh, so I'm just gonna drag this to kind of show some of the visuals without actually playing it. So right here at the very beginning, we kind of saw you know, water and pulp being put into the paper making. You see this being laid down. There's a decolette. This is sort of a vat of pulp, which they're, you know, kind of pouring in some sort of additive, maybe a binder or um, a polyethylene to kind of bind the pulp together or, or some sort of filler. And so all this is broken down pulp. Um, I can't remember if Hanamula is fully integrated, but they are sourcing uh, materials from economically or environmentally responsible papers. Uh, so, or it's environmentally easy. for, easy, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so so it's all, alternative fibers we'll get into a little later, but they are sourcing uh, pulp and fibers from environmentally responsible uh, forests. So they're managed really well and everything. Um, a lot of the, the main ingredient, which is the water is actually pulled from the same spring uh, there in the, in the town. And it's still in the main ingredient. Um, so you see that kind of going, so after that pulp has been in the vat, it's being uh, sprayed into this uh, wire here. That's the pulp and paper starting to formulate on that first segment after the head box where the pulp comes out of over here. And it's going this way in the direction and then it's gonna be pulled up by some blankets right after that, a felt and it's gonna uh, give the impression or natural impression um, into the surface of that paper. So that's sort of one way machine made that uh, the surface is beginning to be formulated in the paper making process. So a lot of the wastewater is kind of taken out and then either reutilized and then purified again and then put back into the spring um, cleaner than what they took it out of. So when a lot of people say, oh, that's a lot of water they're wasting, there's a lot of water recuperation that they put back into the natural source uh, better than it was. So, then see there the embossment of that, uh, uh, of the logo for Anamula um, on the wire there to be uh, placed in the sheet. So, embossing that sheet. And you see this decal edge right here, that's sort of the end of it. Um, a lot of those are made. This sort of score line is where we'll see here how they make their decal edge. So these sheets come off the uh, machine and then they tear in half in that separation. So I thought that was really interesting. So I think uh, here at Finer Works, there's not a lot of decal edge uh, printing yet that they're doing, but uh, we, we do have uh, decal edge. Two styles for the deck lid, okay. one is with the border, one is without. But uh, our uh, honey mule uh, 
certificate of authenticity kits, those those look like those. Uh, it was probably an example of the how they make those. Uh, yes. Certificates. Yes. Yeah. So um, I actually hadn't seen the deco ledge before manufactured like that. So that I thought that was really interesting. So um, as far as uh, typically that paper is going to be manufactured into a roll. Maybe they're maybe they produce it there in a roll and then it gets put into a machine that separates that embossing and the sheet. But um, that wasn't present in the clip. But if that's not the case, it's coming right off the machine and sheets like that. Uh, uncoated machines like that, um, fine art papers like this that are higher end in uh, quality, uh, in texture, in materials, uh, and thicker. They're usually the machines usually ran a lot slower than your typical commercially print papers. Um, some of the more commodity items that they're producing tons of in the commercial print world, those machines are going, you know, super fast. Uh, it doesn't even look like there's paper being formulated, but it's there. So a machine like this um, with higher end, you know, paper being made, you can actually see the pulp sort of moving across and then going through the machine because um, they're making less at a better sort of quality rate, I guess, if you want to say. So, um, uh, so the way this a couple different things, paper man manufacturing basics. So the base stock, uh, the ingredients, you know, what you're seeing in artist papers, uh, normally the standard is 100% cotton rag. Uh, rag isn't so much used anymore as a term, but it is 100% cotton that's your base stock. So why cotton? Cotton's uh, an alternative fiber. It's one of the original fibers. Uh, the lots of currencies manufactured with cotton. It's a strong fiber. It's going to last a long time, and it's you know archival. So when they're making pulp that has quality um, ingredients in there, uh, especially if they're making it acid free, one of the byproducts that they're pulling out of of the pulp is or of the wood and chips is the lignin. And so if any paper's got any lignin inside the pulp, it'll eventually turn brown. Um, it's that's very acidic. So they're needing to pull that out. So a lot of the white papers and bright papers and pulp with cotton, they're not gonna have any of that. So it's totally acid-free, all archival. Um, and then you start getting into other ingredients that you can make brighter or not. And we'll get into that here. So cotton uh, rag, 100% cotton or alpha cellulose, which is wood fiber basically, with other sort of binders, uh, uh, calcium carbonate and uh, maybe some poly of some sort, uh, latex to kind of extrude and create a pulp. You don't normally see that in um, archival uncoated sheets, but you'll start to see a lot more of the chemicals in coated stocks, which we'll get into the type soon. So uh, can, can I ask a question, Lewis? Uh, on the alpha, cell, alpha cellulose papers, uh, uh, they're always marketed to us as being archival. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I remember early on my first inclination because they were alpha cellulose is a wood based product. And we have uh, our, our framing department uses alpha cellulose mats. Right. But I was told those, yes, those are conservation grade, those are acid free. But my first inclination was, well, if they're coming from trees, I'm thinking tree bark. Yeah. yeah. Um, how are they making that, them? That acid? stuff's going to rot. Yeah. <laughs> Are they making those uh, non-acidic? Is it is it it's part of the pulling product? out that lignin? The it's a fiber and as like so material it's, inside it's, the actual. Part, they're they're basically doing a purification. Correct process of to, of to make all those, that. So our mat boards are not acidic. Our our correct the fine art papers that we use for the clays that right are okay. Yeah. So now there are going to be some uh, sheets out there where you know, in sort of the commodity world, whether they be like board grades or even printer grades where, you know, the acid-free quality doesn't necessarily need to be there. And that's um, where, what you see in like the commercial printing world. Some where, packaging where you're yeah. doing, you know, lower end packaging and it's okay. good for what it's good for. And then we know it's going to be recycled or so on and so forth. So, okay. yeah. gotcha. uh, but in this sort of realm, you don't really see that too often. Um, the, cause then the other, uh, acid-free sort of variables that if when you apply a coating on the surface, if um, there's a coating on both sides, the coating is typically acid-free. So if you have a 
base stock in the middle and you have a coating, which I'll talk here, you know, you're kind of you're kind of good to go in a way. So you're so. printing on a acid-free coating, which is right, which, which is, is a still layer, a protective layer correct. over the, the paper. Yeah. Now does that if, so will that also preserve the paper as far as longevity? Uh you know, I think uh the, the quality of that of that stock is only good is this is how I kind of like to think about it is that the quality of your print is only as good as the quality of your materials and the foundation. Yeah. So, you know, it's like building a house or, you know, starting the canvas, you know, do I primer the canvas or do I not primer it? And what is my end result going to look like? So I think, you know, I've seen coated sheets that eventually turn yellow because of um, even though the coating's acid free, the base stock in the middle sort of works its way out. Because yeah. you got to think about paper still being sort of a, a, not a living thing, but a breathing sort of raw material. You know, those fibers, it's wood pulp. It's going to be taking, you know, humidity and all that stuff. Oxygen affects it. You know, when it's colder, the, the fibers get a little tight. Um, when it's warmer, they start to loosen up. So pliability of your sheet, um, the sort of thickness of your sheet feels a little different you know, in different temperatures. And then the way those inks, the way you end up printing on it, all that has a variable to the outcome. Okay. So um, so to, to continue on the manufacturing side, you know, the main ingredient is water, alpha cellulose, binders, and, uh, uh, or contract. So those are the base stocks. And then for digital fine art machine uh, print uh, paper, your end sort of uh, result or uh, ingredient is a base coating, a coating on those sheets uh, not typically a gloss or matte or satin coating, but a inkjet coating, which is an aqueous inkjet coating. So that technology was developed so that they could you could digitally print for from inkjet printers, um, water droplet based inks, um, which Jaclays stands for water drop, um, onto those surfaces. So when you're printing an image digitally aqueous. Uh, you're printing on the coating. Does it absorb into the paper surface a little bit? Yes, it does. It's, it's water, it's gonna spread a little bit, but there's so many dots within that um, uh, print head in the machine uh, that it's going to basically, you know, create this large tonal range of color um, or depth of color if you're doing, you know, one or two color printing as well. So I tried not to talk too much about printing because I'm not the expert in that, but there are some basics that, you know, from printing basics, you can kind of pull from it. No, you, so, you do know quite a bit about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, um, so moving on from the basics of uh, paper manufacturing and making, uh, you know, you're gonna be able to get these uh, sheets and fine art papers in sheets and or rolls. Um, rolls tend to uh, give you a better cost um, overall, depending on what you're printing um, and how often you're printing. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, so paper characteristics, why, why use one paper or the other? Um, some of the things you need to consider is the paper uh, weight and thickness. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna put my notes in here in front of me. Uh, paper weight and thickness, uh, uh, GSM, when you see that uh, acronym, it's grams per square meter. Uh, or uh, caliper, when you hear caliper, they're talking about the thickness of the paper that's usually measured in millimeters. Um, there's no correlation be between those two. Um, we, James and I have had <laughs> conversations on caliper and GSM over and over where we're looking at product and trying to match or um, maybe make decisions on, okay, like, uh, you know, I have this or, you know, I found this and, well, these say the same GSM, but the millimeters are different. And a lot of that has to do, again, with the manufacturing in the, um, the base stock and in the coating. So uh, in their various uh, um, sort of uh, ratios on that to creating those base stocks. Um, surface finish uh, as a characteristic, uh, you've got uh, describers such as smooth velvet, luster, pearl, satin, glossy, and matte. Um, those are all um, how the surface looks. So if you got one, say you're looking at watercolor paper, um, what does that texture look like compared to 
a paper that's termed like a vellum or an eggshell finish. So they look kind of similar. They've got this sort of toothiness to it. Um, you know, I can see the texture on the surface um, or I can't see it, but I can feel it type of thing. And that's where you're starting to really get into the haptics of paper. Now, some of these, uh, your end artwork isn't typically held in, you know, hands like people wear gloves, cotton gloves to sort of not mar the artwork um, or damage the paper or get oils on it. Like that's totally understandable for, for uh, the treatment and care of this a piece of artwork. Um, in the commercial side, you know, haptics is a big thing, you know, in a way with digital fine art, you're creating haptics or you're trying to get a sense of the feeling of the quality of paper visually uh, through what you're printing on the surface and how that surface reacts with that image. So seeing the texture, uh, seeing a solid color, those are all sort of things that, uh, sensations that you get and makes you feel a certain way. So do you see um, just uh, from your experience with dealing with other clients, when uh, it is, are textured papers, do they tend to be held to a higher uh, perceived, is there, would you say there's a higher perceived sense of, of quality with a textured paper over a smooth paper? Uh, yes, easily, yeah. So, I think, you know, yeah, it, it, it sort of gives that paper, um, even visually a sense of heft or distinctiveness for sure, you know, I can, easily distinguish this print over that one. And I'm gonna remember that sort of visual texture that I've ingrained in my brain. And I sort of am curious of how it feels and maybe I shouldn't touch it, but I wanna still feel the print before I purchase it. Or, um, you know, I know it's gonna look a certain way under a mat and a frame on my wall. Uh, you know, when I go to admire the beautiful image that might be on the print, all those surface qualities, whether they're showing through the ink or just the paper in general, are going to give you a more sense of greater value overall. So the artist could use so. that as a selling point oh, or yeah. as a as a way to mark up the oh, definitely. their prints. For sure. When they're printing it yeah. on a textured surface, uh, it, it, because mm -hmm. the perceived value is going to be greater with their buyer. Correct. Yeah, totally. Um, there's a lot of studies on that, uh, there's a really great uh, commercially print piece that Sappy Paper put out uh, called uh, Hap Haptics, The Science of Touch. Uh, amazing information. Um, if anybody's interested in reading that, uh, I think I have copies at my warehouse so we can send one out and stuff. So and Sappy probably has plenty of them too, so. Um, uh, yes. Scott, Scott on our Zoom call is asking, um, does one image type associate better with another, like with with a certain paper, example, high color contrast versus soft contrast on papers. And I think, yes, because we see that like with our fine art velvet paper, if we have a very dark saturated background color, I tend to be a little more delicate with something like that just because a fingernail going across the paper on such a saturated color background will leave a mark. Um, right. So is there, um, what what helps people decide, I guess, um, on like saturation of their uh, thing on, on that texture? What can they, what is a good, uh, I guess, what what can they look for? What should they look for in, the pa in a paper if you have a very high contrast or soft contrast print? So um, good question, Scott. So I think let's hold on to that one right there. And I'm gonna finish through the paper characteristics. Because in the next segment, I'm going to get into paper types, because okay. then we're going to start to sort of uh, parse out different types of paper for specific imagery and results. So um, yeah, I just that, and that'll be very helpful to our eyes because uh, that can be very subjective to to some, but uh, with the right knowledge, they, they can be able to make some better decisions on that. And, uh, right. Uh, so. Yeah. And it's a lot of information too, so I don't want to jump too far ahead. <laughs> so I want to try and stay with the flow. So I will answer that in just a moment, actually. So, uh, so we talked about surfaces. Uh, uh, the other sort of paper characteristic to think about is uh, the brightness and whiteness of a sheet of paper. So it's getting close to 
what Scott's asking about on there. So, um, uh, so you can sort of, you know, parse out, you know, white sheets of paper. There's all, you know, a spectrum of white stocks, a blue white sheet or balanced white sheet. So in the fine art uh, Jucle world, they're usually talking about a bright white or a natural white. So the natural that you see in the, the Jucle world, excuse me, it's not really a natural color because in the commercial print side, it's more of like a off-white yellow ecru color. So while there are some stocks out there available like that, when you're getting into the white realm, blue whites are gonna be higher brightness, um, very, those will usually print out, uh, like if you have a high contrast image, those are typically the sheets you would use. Um, and then a balanced white slash natural white in the fine art world, you would um, typically do softer. Um, so there's a little bit of trick with that though, because there's some printing things that I've noticed that sort of translate from the commercial world that sort of translate into the to clay world. Um, I've noticed that if you have a black and white image and you put it on a blue white, stark bright white sheet, it's gonna give you a, your really high contrast. It's gonna really darken up those blacks. But if you go into, um, and it, it's pleasing, you get that contrast. Sometimes blue white is too bright. You know, it's sort of like the blue light that you see on your cell phones, on your smartphones. Um, too much blue light sort of irritates the eyes. Uh, I think it, of it uh, an example of books uh, when you go get a book at, you know, wherever, um, when you look at the interior text sheets, if it's a case bound book, uh, a novel or uh, a collection of poetry, it's usually a balanced white sheet because that typography is going to be small and they want you to stay um, involved with those, that imagery, that typography on there um, to continue to read it. Um, same thing with imagery. Uh, how long do you want the viewer to stay with your piece of artwork? Um, is the whiteness going to be really relaxing to the eye? Usually a balanced white natural sheet's going to do that for you. You're going to stay with it a little longer. So, so, so uh, at a subconscious level, it could affect uh, a person's appreciation for your, oh, yeah. for your art based right. on the right. tones of the paper. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a tool that you can use to sort of um, it might captivate you know, them more if they're right. on a more pleasing. Yeah, you can comment. use it as a tool for the artist's intent. You yeah. know, obviously when we're talking about art, there's X amount of variables that we can take into consideration why someone makes something um, with whatever materials. So, uh, and papers are no different than that. Uh, uh, so yeah, but um, so brightness of whiteness, you know, blue white, balanced white. Uh, uh, papers are papers without any, you know, brightening agents, which we'll get into, uh, or coatings are naturally warmer in shade. So if you had a naturally made paper with no extra ingredients, uh, typically it's going to be an off-white, you know, type of sheet. Um, so the one of the things that helps with the blue, white, or brighter bright white sheets are OBAs and um, optical brightener agents. You know, they make paper. Whiteness more blue and white shade tend to give off deeper blacks, which um, you may hear the terminology of the DMAX measurement. So uh, papers, you know, have a good DMAX. They have a deeper black, richer black. The, the, um, the, the capacity to achieve a deeper black is not the greater the DMAX. Okay, so um, <laughs> turn, uh, let me see. So, uh, but tend to turn back to original natural paper white point over time. So um, OBAs, you know, they, they're, they're good, but uh, they also eventually that shaded paper, or that, that paper itself will change back to its original shade of sort of the natural. Um, yes, you're probably gonna need a lot of time to do that, but environment of where that piece of artwork is being cared for and being seen, um, you know, if you have it in front of a window and there's direct sunlight, yes, it's gonna turn you know, yellow or fade out faster, even if it is behind something um, where, you know, OBA free papers are a little bit better and more archival. So, um, so the uh, uh, natural uh, sheets are gonna be used, better used on neutral, or I'm sorry, OBA bright white sheets are gonna be better used on neutral images. So black and white photography. So I think still, I think that's relative because I do really appreciate a good 
off-white balance white with black and white. I tend to think from the commercial print side and that translate to the uh, fine art side, the blacks actually get bumped up a little bit more using an off-white balance white or natural sheet. It may make the black a little warmer um, and create a really great contrast. So, but that's just the personal preference. <laughs> yeah, it, and, well, I, I know it is a, a, a concern with, you know, a lot of black and white photographers, for instance, uh, or people that do say charcoal phone, mm -hmm. prints, you know, they, they, you know, they'll want it to be a true black and white. They, and, and we tell them how to desaturate tones and stuff and convert it to, you know, uh, not necessarily grayscale, but remove all color other than the gray spectrum within the image file. And then they print it on a uh, bright white paper and yeah, they get a very black and white print, but how long is it gonna stay looking as a black and white print? Because it's the brighter the paper, the more likely it is gonna have those optical brightening agents, Correct. those bleaching agents. Yeah, and they tend to, to uh, say that there's a little less control on the whiteness of the shade of paper mm -hmm. when you're using optical brighteners. And that's the same for uh, that in the commercial print world as well with really bright white sheets. Yeah. I think uh, uh, an instance I always remember is that we had a particular item available to us that was a really blue white sheet, bright white, like 99 point whatever, or 101 point, whatever brightness, <laughs> blue whiteness. And uh, we got it and it looked purple. So, <laughs> cause at yeah, first time it looks say. like a white. And then after a while you look back at it, and boom, it's, it's purple. Like it looks sort of lavender -y. And, wow. and yeah, that was something that we could sell. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so moving on, uh, if there's any questions, not any questions on characteristics, I'll move on to types of paper. Um, mm -hmm. So getting to, uh, so fine. So, you do have a question, uh, Lewis. Uh, let's see. The question of OBA is helpful. Does uh, Finer Works list, I guess this would be for James, list OBA use in their papers? Uh, yes. I, I'm, I'll speak up because uh, I was uh, pointing point out that it was hard to hear me because um, uh, me and Lewis were in the same room and uh, we can't have both mics on. Otherwise, we get some weird feedback. Uh, but yeah, we. we we do uh, indicate which papers, when, when we know that a paper is OBA free, we indicate that. Uh, typically the OBA papers, uh, as Lewis indicated, are gonna be more archival. They're not going to, you know, those, those tones are not gonna break down in the image as the uh, bleaching agents of the OBAs break down. Uh, we do have some papers which, uh, have OBAs. Now, OBAs, uh, uh, what I've been telling them, are not necessarily bad. Correct. But uh, they're not going to be, have this, you know, that, that the tones and the, the colors are not going to have the same long lasting, uh, are not going to be as long lasting in an OBA, a paper with OBAs, which again means optical brightening agent. So uh, uh, papers with OBAs are very common in the, the, uh, the clay, the fine art printing world. Uh, it's just, uh, it's a little bit better if you can utilize a paper which is OBA free. And we, we indicate which one's in the description if we know that a paper is OBA free. So, um, and you know, long lasting is sort of relative to like really what's the intent of long lasting, you know, uh, some of these papers say they're archival 100 years plus, which, you know, is great, but, you know, I hope I live to 100 to see, to see that, you know, so I mean, um, so yeah, so it, it's kind of intent as well. So, so moving on to types of paper, so you can sort of categorize fine art digital declay papers into sort of two segments. Um, the mills go as far as to subcategorize them uh, between different, uh, you know, materials. So, and I'll get into that later. So uh, the first one would be that you would see the most of are the fine art matte papers is what they're kind of called. Uh, those are the ones that are uncoated. Uh, they don't have, um, they have, they're made out of cotton 100% or alpha cellulose papers. Uh, they're going to be, um, uh, the cotton sheets are going to be higher end. 
uh, long lasting average of 100 years. Uh, some of the examples paper wise of 100% cotton rags are Hanamula's uh, photo rag, 100% uh, cotton, the 308, and then also the uh, Hanamula, Hanamula Torshan is a 100% alpha cellulose sheet. So those have really great um, surface qualities, you know, while one's a little bit more of a cloudy kind of softer feel, it still looks, they're mold made, which is the next sort of description that um, I'm gonna give you uh, in the map papers. Uh, mold made um, is basically, it's got a surface, a texture on the surface that's made in line on the machine uh, with an embossing dye. So uh, there's some sort of embossing dye after it's picked up that creates this sort of um, pattern in the surface. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit more irregular than some. Uh, these would be, mold made papers would be the closest thing to original handmade papers uh, with that variation. It's just, you know, you can control the quality if it's machine made and then you have that uh, sort of embossing, you know. Uh, the question mark. here is, is the cotton based paper, do they tend to be more pliable just because they're cotton based? Is that why is it an alpha cellulose? In other words, because off the cellulose, uh, I know with my own experience with the papers, is they they seem a lot more rigid and a lot less. Uh, you know, they they retain their memory, uh, the 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 curl memory. Yes. More, uh, yeah, the longer. fibers are going to seem a little bit more harder or tighter, I guess, if you want to say. Yeah. Um, I would think cotton fibers are going to be a little longer mm -hmm. uh, when you think of rag, you know, and the way they sort of manufacture it. Um, uh, it's going to be a really sort of pulpy sort of base stock. Um, and as far as the surface goes, you know, genuinely, you know, you want, when you're talking cotton papers, you're thinking of that sort of uh, toothiness on the surface. You want to see that tactile finish on the surface uh, visually. Yeah. So um, cotton papers are extremely popular with letter pressers these days. Um, letter pressing has come full circle as uh, many of you may have seen, uh, creating you know, cards on old wooden type or metal type or uh, plates and you know, getting that impression inside the surface, um, which typically, I guess, old school wise, it, it's, you're not supposed to see the indentation into the surface. Um, if otherwise you do it wrong, but now uh, that's the thing. It's like, I want to see my typography or my image impressioned into the surface of a cotton sheet and, and even seeing the bruising on the back. So, um, uh, and, and that brings up a good point because sometimes we will have uh, people ask us, which paper sh should I choose? Because I, I do, let's say they, they're doing a signed and number series, but they like to emboss like a seal or something like that in the margins of their print. So it's, uh, uh, and people ask which is a better paper and I never really thought about it, but it's not, it seems to be the cotton-based papers are more appropriate for that. For sure, definitely, yeah. yeah. It, and it's also gonna be a, a matter of uh, thickness of the sheet. So depending on what they're stamping in with, how, how clean and, uh, kind of not well designed that their stamp is, but depending on the actual metal die or what you're stamping into the surface, um, the depth of it can give you the impression, the pressure, I mean, all of that can be relative. So, um, you know, those are definitely things to think about. A thinner sheet, you're gonna make the impression a little uh, easier, even if it is a cotton sheet, but for thicker cotton stocks, you'll get the impression, but will it really show your full embossing if you're trying to get it into there? So, um, so uh, the mold made papers, you know, are typically your, your uh, nicer sheets. Um, the William Turner is a mold made paper. I'm gonna show you all some surface texture and see if I can see it on the- no, you might need to angle your camera. Oh, oh I there. do see it right there. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of see that surface right there. Mm -hmm. That's the Hanamula uh, William Turner, which is one of their most uh, popular sheets um, right there. Uh, anything with texture is going to be similar, trying to reflect some sort of texture out there. So, uh, you know, James talked about a linen, a linen texture that will, he's going to be offering, um, that's meant to look like textiles. So that come, we see that type of type of paper in, um, you know, commercial and digital printing uh, on the other side. You and know. we actually have a linen embossed right. paper for our cardstock, which is a, you know, 
obviously it's a different type of yeah animal altogether yeah when it comes that, to paper yeah definitely not to clay but um but it still gives you that sense of like hey you know the quality of a surface and the the uh, visual experience overall with the image um so um moldy papers uh uh, natural alternative fibers um, are part of the sort of mat lines. Uh, Hanumula goes so far as to sort of put them in a separate category because of the fact that they're alternative fibers. They're Hanumula ba uh, bamboo, hemp, and agave papers, which I know Fineworks offers. Um, those are uh, environmentally conscious papers, so they're using, you know, resources and, and recycling uh, pulp and things like that for, to make these papers. Um, they're using renewable energy with wind power, uh, solar and water, uh, that's 100% off the grid. So that's sort of a big, you know, uh, reasoning that you can say that, you know, these papers are higher quality. Uh, they're trying to put back into the environment and, and give back and, and uh, be responsible about that. So that, there's another sort of selling point if uh, you're trying to sort of, uh, you know, mark up your work a certain percentage or something, you know, to kind of make them more valuable, I guess. Um, uh, and before we go too much further into that, uh, I want to kind of uh, go back to, you know, talking about the uh, papers and uh, just to make sure that we're, we're clear on this, to answer a question that we got. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the uh, participants on Zoom uh, does uh, uh, their prints their, uh, of their oil paintings, which are very vibrant and very in color, okay? Uh, the question is, which paper is based upon what we've discussed? What are the properties that, that they want to look for um, to, to achieve those? Now, I would say those bright white papers, like you described, mm -hmm. uh, they're gonna be less expensive. And so this question, I guess I'm just asking for, confirmation if, if, if what I'm saying is correct here, they want a, a bright white paper if they want to also keep the cost down as well. Is that those? Yes, so um, we're actually, well, we are going to get into, there's another segment of the paper types that talks about costs with that. So okay. typically you would look at, and I can kind of go over it, typically you'd want to look at like a, a resin coated paper uh, RC papers that sort of mimic, you know, RC prints, uh, you know, from kind of like our satin luster. Correct. Paper. Yeah. Yeah. So those would, yeah. you know, uh, they would mimic the original photo lab prints are, that they called RC prints because they're resin coated. So uh, resin coated sheets are an alpha cellulose space in the middle with, you know, uh, some sort of polyethylene coating uh, sheets on the top and bottom. So it's sort of encapsulated. So you're printing directly on that coating and it's not really getting into the paper base. So it's sort of a carrier for that. Now, um, those are gonna be typically less expensive. They're mostly gonna have OBAs in them um, and then they're gonna be uh, a brighter white for sure. So um, um, not necessarily you know, non-archival, but uh, there are some, you know, I don't know if there's any resin coated, you know, cotton sheets, that doesn't make sense. It's more of a variety of coating, which I'll go back to. So for the oil uh, painting uh, artists, uh, if they want a bright white sheet, yes, you could typically, you could look at you know, OBA re resin coated sheets uh, to keep costs down. Um, when you're using the resin coated sheets, I would think re uh, cost is primarily the reason you would do that. Uh -huh. So, but then outside of that, uh, I think it's sort of uh, personal perspective as far as like how you want that image to be represented. Um, you know, what is the image of? Is it just brushstrokes? Is it a, you know, a still life? Is it an outdoor scene? You know, um, you sort of have to really think about more of the image and what it's trying to, the intent of that image as compared to, um, hey, I just wanna get this out and this is where it needs to be. You know, yes, there's room for that. So um, as long as you're comfortable with your original intent, I think of the artwork, um, can definitely consider the paper and the quality of the paper uh, to help push where you want it to be. I mean, every artist I think is gonna have a good, better, best sort of scenario. Hey, you know, I have something sort of low cost for um, everyday printing, which 
resin coated papers, RC papers are going to be more of. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to have a higher end uh, edition that's going to be limited and it's going to be on a different quality paper. It's going to be signed and numbered and, yeah. you know, authorized and all that. So, so, so they're going it, to, it's, it's really the, you know, how they're, you know, if they're, like we said earlier, they're the better, the higher end papers or like textures, you're going to probably mark up as well. You're going to make those special. Right. Versus, so, right. Um, so really the answer is that, you know, if cost is an issue, but you do want, you know, good quality, color and tones, and you may have to go with one of those resin coated papers. Um, uh, those prints are not going to look and feel as good as the higher end ones, but yeah. you know, you're know you offsetting the cost right. of that. It, but again, I think it still depends overall on the image that's being printed sure. and what it because is. Some, so. some images might not be able right. to take advantage of what that, that paper offers. Correct. Yeah. So, um, and that's always a good conversation to have with whoever's doing your, your printing for you, or if you're printing on your own or, you know, uh, ordering samples from Finerworks, you know, they offer the sample packs uh, of print samples, you know, send in a small, you know, example of your work to get printed on a sheet, you know, maybe give them some direction on leave half of it blank and the other image on here and offset it so you can see the quality of whiteness and then your image printed on it. Correct, Lewis. I tell, we, we do something like that with uh, geo galleries for our artists when I'm telling them to do a test print, especially when we have discounts like this. Mm -hmm. um, I go into Photoshop and I slice from the original uh, completed you know, image. So if I it's, say it's gonna be a 16 by 20, I'll probably take a section of that 16 by 20 and put it into a new file that's maybe an eight by 10 and then I'll go open maybe another 20 by 30, take a slice from that. If, as long as I have them all pretty much where I want color wise, and I'm gonna print them all on the same paper media, I lay them all into this eight by 10, kind of like, you know, like a, a test strip when you're doing old school photography. And I would send a print in one so I could also see the actual size on the paper that how the, if it's not gonna have any blur, but just to see how those colors react with like the color of the paper, as we were saying, the, the white of the paper. And I leave myself a white border around, uh, or I order it with like a half inch border. And uh, that for me, lets me test out um, the paper for that particular artist and show them, hey, take a look at this. Does this look like what you're hoping for? Um, and I think Sarah there was asking about that. So, uh, Sarah, if we don't get, if it still sounds kind of fuzzy, uh, I'll do, I'll send you a Zoom call link and we can jump on and um, we can do one of those. But another question we have here, uh, Lewis, and I don't know if this is a section that makes uh, the best sense to ask it, is, uh, and the way they explained it was the, the memory of the bend of the paper. So sometimes we send paper out in tubes and a lot of the times people are asking, well, how do I flatten that paper? As I have learned, time and pressure, you can flatten anything. So... Mm -hmm. Is there a, is there like this Tershawn paper, somebody was mentioning, mentioning, they ordered that and they ordered it too, but it took too long for them to flatten and they don't feel like they could mount that. Um, like I said, I've mounted probably every meat paper media that there is yeah. and <laughs> time and pressure. So but, um, um, yeah, there's, so there's no really easy way to answer that one. But, I mean, I can tell you why, why that happens, but as mm -hmm. far as the end result, so um, uh, some papers, depending on the pulp and the fiber, you know, they're gonna be uh, tighter fibers or stronger fibers, they're gonna just hold its memory. But again, you know, you need to think about the fact that uh, this is again, a raw material that's, you know, almost living and breathing. It's actually breathing. It's like um, a guitar or a piece of wood, you know, unfinished wood. If you leave it out in the elements, a piece of lumber at some point it'll warp or it'll sort of start to bow with the elements. Um, paper is going to do that as well. Um, uh, with a you know acoustic guitar, they sort of care and care and uh, of that you know wood product. Uh, in cold weather, you want to um, uh, leave it in a case. In uh, warm weather, I think you want to leave it out. I think that's the way they say. So because that wood fiber, that wood product is expanding and contracting with the uh, uh, different temperatures. And that's exactly what paper is doing all the time. 
when you're printing, like in the commercial world, when you're printing at a print shop, uh, they order paper, you know, X amount of time in advance and let it acclimate to their environment in their press room so that they can put it on press without any issues. Um, same thing here, y'all stock and inventory some uh, product here so that when you go to print, it's sort of acclimated to the environment. You know, your, your setting where your machines are at are very sort of controlled and stuff. So uh, it, that's not an easy way to sort of answer as far as, you know, uh, printing. I've, I've ordered prints before where the artist sent them flat and that was the wrong thing to do. Um, so yeah, and, uh, and uh, you can always press them, I believe, uh, maybe with no heat uh, in a, in well, a press you know, of some sort, but yeah, it, you know. Depends. You have to, I do know we tell the customers be careful. If yeah. Flat. I mean, we have some customers which will take an iron and flat yeah. that way. And it, it, that can yeah. work, but you do have to uh, yeah. do it carefully. But uh, yeah, certain papers we, we just coming off the printer has, oh yeah still is curling yeah and uh yeah it, it, it yeah like what was said it takes time <laughs> yeah and sometimes too um I, I know i've had some issues before with certain items or one particular item that you know keeps its memory too much and a part of me wonders okay uh, i know that uh with commercial jumbo rolls so when we're looking at commodity sheets in the commercial print side they're making these jumbo rolls that are huge. There's so many tons of, of paper on there. They cut them into smaller rolls and then they rewind them into other rolls and then they sheet them into sheets. Um, so uh, at some point, um, even when we sheet at our facility here in San Antonio and in Dallas, uh, we take rolls and we sheet them into, come down into smaller sheets on our sheeter. At some point that roll, when you get towards closer to the core, there's, there's a, a level of variability that's not really great with that material. So there's a certain amount there that we have to recycle and not use when we create into sheets because they retain its curl. So sometimes I wonder with thicker stock, especially in the fine art world, um, sometimes that's gonna happen, I think. Uh, and I'm not quite sure what kind of quality control they have with that um, on, the, on that type of, uh, you know, that type of format. Uh, but if I have a better answer than, well, I'm not sure, I'll definitely let you know. Um, using a thinner stock, uh, I know sometimes, you know, there's not uh, a material out there, you know, a, a thicker caliper or, uh, you know, less GSM, um, you know, might do the trick, but uh, some papers, uh, like the Torshan, that mold made paper, when you look at that surface, you can sort of hold it up to the light and see the variation of the pulp on the sheet somewhat. Um, with other sheets, you can sort of do that as well. Uh, that's gonna be the sort of mold made sort of variation of the sheet that gives you the, the strength in some areas and some in not, and it's pliability. So that could be another variable there. Um, other sheets do that as well. Embossing can kind of if there's an actual embossed texture in the sheet that could hinder it from being more pliable. Um, there's a number of things that we've come across before that uh, it's something some people just kind of work through and so, so but hope that helps a little bit, but yeah. uh, and I have to be off for that. So, um, so uh, continuing with some fine art map paper characteristics. We've already talked about natural line from Hanamula. Other hemp has been a big fiber in the last, you know, five years. And I was waiting for uh, the digital fine art side to get it. And everybody's got a fine art hemp now. So, and uh, then in the commercial side, everybody's got a hemp uh, commercial print paper for packaging and so on and so forth as well. Um, some in the past that you've seen, uh, bamboo has been a big alternative fiber. Hana Mill has still got the bamboo and a finer workshop for that here. Um, uh, there's also been a sugarcane based stock that I don't think is around. Uh, they're using, utilizing a uh, byproduct of sugarcane called uh, bagasse. Um, so if you see that, that's a really nice uh, sort of uh, utilization of a byproduct of, uh, of uh, alternative fiber. Um, the last sort of uh, the scripture, one sort of coding thing that is used in finer map papers. Uh, I think in the last five to 10 years, the Barida 
uh, term and, and coating has been brought out. So you see these uh, baryta sheets that have this extra barium sulfite coating. Can, now that's a question that uh, I, I wanted to ask you is, and the question we, we do get is, what does baryta, what do we mean by baryta? Because there's many different brands. Hand Mill has a, a line of baryta papers, uh, Moab, uh, Canson, you know, the, the big name brands in right. the fine art clay papers world offer papers which they call baryta. With the baryta. What makes, what, what is baryta? Baryta is basically barium sulfide. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so it's a, and, and why is baryta so well, why is there such a demand for baryta so uh the baryta uh coated papers which i believe uh, i think barium sulfide was used as a binder in traditional paper making but uh it's used as a coating now in the pulp or after the pulp is made um i believe after uh that gives it another sheen level of sheen that's similar to the traditional silver halide photo papers. So that you would see in dark room. So, um, and you can tell very distinctively those bright of papers. Um, one of the things I've read too, and I think I've noticed is that they actually do have sort of a particular smell because of that coating and they do. And um, you can tell by looking at the surface that, oh, that's a bright of sheet, even if it's not labeled you can make a pretty good educated guess once you've experienced it. So um, what's nice about that coating is that uh, I'm not exactly sure the science behind it, but for some reason it punches up the black tones, D, the D max of it and everything like yeah. really well. Yeah, so that's what we've seen with uh, all the samples that we get. That mm -hmm. it's very, very, very deep black. Yes, so that's a good uh, paper to sort of test out. I'm not sure how it does with um, maybe traditional art like oil painting imagery or graphic design imagery or watercolor. Uh, that would be interesting to see actually though, but um, on the photography side, Baryta is a good uh, way to go. Um, and you can get those with 100% cotton on them and there are some resin coated uh, Baryta sheets as well. So uh, alpha cellulose and then there's some cotton sheets. So you got a good gamut with that sort of uh, opportunity there. Um, so on the fine art, art map papers as well, some do have OBAs in them, very few and far between, but most of them are OBA free, which is nice. Uh, so the second type of fine art paper, those are all the op uh, other options in matte fine art papers, which are typically uncoated. On the fine art side paper of photo papers, that's the second realm. Those are gonna be usually all RC papers, resin coated, that's what it stands for. Uh, alpha cellulose space with the polyethylene binder with then the inkjet coating on it. Uh, those mimic the original photo lab prints. Uh, so some examples that they offer here, are the Moab, uh, the LaSalle or Exhibition Luster or the archival mat, I believe. Um, well, the archival mat, I don't think is resin coated. I think. Uh, the LaSalle Exhibition Luster, and then maybe the, I don't think the Bride. I can't remember if there's another one that you'll have that's RC coded. I can't remember. They, there's a lot of options here. <laughs> that works. So, but I know for sure Exhibition Luster is, is resin coded, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'll have to go back and check. Cool. So <laughs> the, the number of papers we have now, it's getting a little bit harder to yeah. remember everything. Yeah. Now. It means I'm doing my job probably. So oh, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, obviously the Kodak professional papers oh, yeah. For uh, sure. are, are going to be Yeah, coded. definitely, uh, definitely. Uh, uh, but um, So yeah. then uh, your, you know, typical surfaces are going to be that pearl, the luster, the um, I'm guessing gloss. Like, like the photo rag metallic is probably. Uh, I'm not the photo rag I'm sorry, the uh, metallic, uh, just the metallic. Oh, yes, photo the, the photochrome, right? Yeah. The photochrome pearl. Yeah. You yes. just call it metallic paper. Oh, okay. On, yeah. Yeah. So the photo, the Hanamula uh, photo rag metallic is an interesting one because uh, while it does have that metallicized uh, look, um, or coating, it's 
cotton and it's mm -hmm. the only one of its type that's 100 percent cotton so um i'm sure a handful of y'all printed on that you know order some prints on that and check it out uh, metallic sheets have uh, across the spectrum of commercial and wide format have mm -hmm. come up in the last 10 years yeah, um, that, that so awesome it's oh, it's yeah. just a really great sheet to to test out um so the RC papers usually have OBAs in them. So are they necessarily bad for you? Not necessarily. I mean, over time, um, you're paying less, but you know you could pay more with just color artwork, I guess, um, or, or not necessarily archivability. Uh, but they are lower price point. So those are things to think about there. Um, so after all of that sort of characteristics and types of papers, are there any questions on the types of papers there? So far, no, it, um, nothing. Okay. So I think uh, when James and Melissa originally invited me to do the talk, it was like, what paper should I use? <laughs> and I think that was even on the advertisement. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a loaded question because, you know, I think you should use all of them, yeah. <laughs> basically, <laughs> you know, test them all out. Um, a good way to that's sort of... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I kind of what, what should we have for dinner tonight? <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, um, so I, I've sort of compiled some things to think about. Uh, you know, my, my sort of end answer to that is uh, it depends on the image maker and their intent of their work and, and sort of what's being, you know, printed as either original piece of artwork or an addition of artwork. Um, again, we kind of talked about uh, the uses of whiteness, blue white or natural white, uh, the use of texture and how that makes people feel uh, or the lack of texture and sort of the uh, RC papers and their coatings and what they sort of do, you know, they, they create great color, but do they really give you that warmth that maybe an or image can, or, or a sense of value, yeah. So um, there's pluses and minuses, there's pros and cons for all of them but definitely there's pros for using those papers, um, you know, depending on what you want to do. Uh, you know, does one artist do just the one thing? Um, I tend to think, no, you know, I tend to think that there's times where they break out of their sort of norm and go, you know, I'm going to go this route. I'm going to do RC papers in May and I'm going to do all, you know, textured uncoated papers, bridal papers in December. You know, like <laughs> that's a good sort of, uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, experiment process. Um, so consider these questions for choosing the right paper. Th this may be sort of a, uh, information we talked about, but the image being printed, am I printing a black and white image or full or photo or full color artwork or photo? Um, you know, those base paper stocks tend to change the image sometimes or enhance the image. Um, will texture get in the way of fine detail? So if you're choosing a, a matte paper with texture um, and you've got really intricate details that you want to uh, the viewer to experience, um, how does the paper texture sort of interrupt that value of the detail in the artwork? And, and, I, and I'd like to remark on that is that uh, on, you know, a lot of times we'll tell people is that if, if uh, the detail is very important to go with a smoother paper, smoother surface paper, uh, not necessarily go with it, you know, uh, totally smooth, right. but, you know, the toothier, the texture, the, the greater chance some of those details are just kind of not lost, but they're overcome by that texture. Mm -hmm. In other words, people see the texture before they see the detail. Right. But at the same time, it can also be a safeguard. Let's say we'll, we'll have people send us uh, a file to print that's a low resolution image. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they just don't have a, maybe they don't, they no longer have the original piece. And they, so they just have a smaller uh, low res file that they have to work with. Well, sometimes the textured surface, a paper with that textured surface helps hide that lack of yeah. resolution and they can get away with a slightly larger uh, print than they otherwise might on a smoother paper. Right, that's yeah. exactly right. Um, you know, we see that too in the commercial side with design, you know, and typography and things like that. You know, 
uh, we're trying, we're using the texture to hide something potentially that, oh, we're not going to see it or, you know, hey, we're utilizing the texture to compensate for something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think in imagery production as well that we're creating, that's important to use as a tool. Yeah. So and think about that, but uh, also have that discussion with uh, your, your, your image provider that, you know, with finer works or uh, if you need technical assistance, if you're printing in house call, you know, uh, your rep or, you know, you can always reach out to any of us at Clampit. So, but um, so uh, find detail, uh, uh, make a, so will a solid color be changed um, from the shade when being printed? So again, blue white versus a natural white or even the metallic sheets, you know, metallic prints look a little different when they're printed. So- And that's because lack of a white base. Right, right. That, yeah. that mica coating is gonna, for mica coating is gonna come through and it's gonna, you know, the inks are trans are transparent, um, yeah, transparent, translucent right. rather, <laughs> translucent. And so they're gonna yeah. uh, uh, let the base of the paper shine through. So that could create an interesting end result as well yeah, overall. It can, uh, what we see is it creates uh, an effect that people really like or don't like. Yeah. It, 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 <laughs> usually there's not much in yeah. between. Yeah. And uh, that's because you, you don't have a, you know, all, most, not all, most printing or at least uh, fine art printing and photo printing is is based upon it having a white base because the printers we use uh, uh, typically do not have a a do not lay out a coat of white ink right. first yeah um, you know not yet <laughs> not, not yet <laughs> or, like, or, or like a white timer they, yeah. they, they, they count on that to be provided right with, you know, on the paper already, right? And so, to the to get the uh, various tones and achieve certain tones, it looks at the white point on that paper or the, the software that's printed with. And so, with a metallic paper, which has a almost a, I don't want to say gray, but a kind of a more silvery right. white, mm -hmm. it's going to be based. Your tones are going to be. You know, compensated for that going to be as white as that silver silver Based white. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and a lot of that's going to have to do with those icc profiles that they print on the media so and, and those are used um, to compensate right to, and sometimes to trick the eye into making you <laughs> think that you're yeah. seeing white when you're not right <laughs> <laughs> so um it's another magic. <laughs> yeah, it's magic, paper magic. So um, another thing also to consider uh, performance of paper. So uh, how long do I want this to last? So I'm sorry, per, uh, permanence. <laughs> I need some readers, but permanence. Uh, how long do I want this to last? Um, uh, we kind of talked about um, the Hanamalu Mills and then uh, Moab. And then uh, there's several other... Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, several other manufacturers throughout the world that create fine art papers. Uh, I, I know Melissa mentioned about uh, any of them being manufactured uh, domestically in the States. Uh, the only one I knew of was the Strathmore uh, that's being manufactured by Mohawk Paper Mills up in uh, Coes, New York. Um, I'm not sure what Strathmore is going to do, but it's a brand that's been around for over 100 years. So uh, you see Strathmore brands, you know, when you go into an art store and you're picking up a sketch pad, um, or you're going to see like Canson or um, some of these other art papers. I, it's been a while since I've been into an art store to get a sketch pad uh, since I work for a paper company, but, you know, <laughs> um, but uh, I, I know those brands are still around, but uh, the Strathmore one is the only one domestically that I know of. Uh, Hanamula, Kansan, um, Moab, they're all made. Uh, Hanamula is in Germany and uh, Moab, at least some of the Moab items are made in uh, the St. Cuthbert's Mill, uh, close south of England. Um, so, uh, so quality of manufacturing and history and experience. So that's sort of what I was getting to with that long answer. Um, the experience that these paper manufacturers have had over creating uh, various papers over time and their legacy. Um, so obviously there's something to be said for a mill that's been around for over a hundred years uh, in, in the paper industry, whether it be arts or commercial um, or even with a new product. Um, 
you know, uh, definitely do some research on that. That's another way to sort of add value to your uh, work that you're creating. Um, not everybody's going to know it, but some people will know like, oh, like, you know, that's, you know, William Turner or Photorag or Intratorag or Somerset Velvet. They're going to know, or that's Kenson, uh, uh, whatever, and, and uh, Strathmore. So um, you yeah, can use it, it. It also elevates your work uh, with your peers, which for some can be important. Oh, because, yeah. Because uh, yeah. let's say <clears throat> an, an example is if uh, you're doing a, uh, a jury, you know, print competition. Mm -hmm. um, you know the, the, you know they're they could be judging just the imagery, but they could also be judging the quality of the print itself and the paper that it's printed on could have a bearing. Yeah, I can tell you, I judge a lot of printing uh, when I see it. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, yeah, I'm kind of a paper snob, but. Um, I can appreciate a really good, you know, intent of usage of, of not necessarily lower quality, but um, less expensive paper. I mean, I understand that there's usage for that all the time. And, uh, you know, uh, if there's a certain intent of using that or way of using it, um, I can totally have respect for that. I, I get it. So, um, so uh, and then, you know, price, obviously, to consider. Um, most people are going to start out, you know, lower budget, but uh, you can create a plan to do higher end budget prints. Like we said, addition prints on a nicer paper or more of a commodity series. That's for everyday printing type of thing. It's okay to have those sort of avenues of um, producing your work as long as you're producing, you know, I would think. Um, uh, so with that, I would say, um, I know there was a question about embellishments outside of that, what are safe to use? I'm not exactly sure as far as the safety of which ones are best to use for your prints. Um, embossing or uh, the surface um, is a very easy one. You can do it by hand, you can do it with a die. Uh, I've seen some prints where people that go back and use like gold leafing. Um, so it sort of depends on the intent that you're trying to, what you want to portray or what you've seen, what you're, and it's all preference. Um, and, and you know, we, we tell people, uh, uh, we tell people to always use, you know, always test the papers with any sort of embossing uh, or not embossing, embellishing, because uh, not all papers will react the same way to water or other chemicals that are the carrier of those pigments. Right. Yeah. A good way to do that. Uh, so I know uh, Hanumula has um, some sample packs that are available. You know, if you're, you know, buying online or, you know, we sell them at our store too locally uh, and they break them out into smooth, textured and glossy. And so with the range of their products that they offer, they give you maybe one or two like letter size sheets that if you're printing in house, or even if you want to just get the plain paper and sort of work with it directly with whatever embellishments, um, you can sort of test that out too, or even see the texture of it. Um, if it's not something that may be offered here at Finer Works already. Uh, I'm, I'm getting a little closer because a lot of people are having a hard time. Oh, <laughs> what's that? Uh, yeah, yeah, just because uh, I, uh, it, uh, I'll piggyback that on <laughs> your microphone. No problem. Um, no, uh, what I was saying is uh, uh, to if you want to try the different papers, uh, as far as which ones will take embellishments, uh, you can also contact Finer Works. Uh, uh, we actually have a sample kit. So uh, it's, it's, it's $20, but you'll get that $20 back in the form of a gift card. Uh, use that to test, you know, if it's an oil-based paint or acrylic paint, you know, put little paint daubs on it or, or uh, if you're doing gold leaf, what have you, um, because uh, uh, the papers will react differently based upon the properties, the coatings on them and so forth. So, yeah. so it's, it's, a, uh, it's a great way, easy way to kind of test that. And it's also an easy way to sort of figure out um, or narrow down you know, the sort of question of which paper I should use. Um, you know, I, I think of it as to creating swatches 
of uh, say you get the same image printed on 10 different sheets of paper in the sample. Um, that's a good way to see um, how those textures and surfaces are going to uh, recreate that image that you're getting printed. Um, and you can sort of narrow down between the group, you know, the top three, uh, whether that's being, you know, less color, black and white, high contrast, or even full color range, warmer tones, cooler tones, um, you know, even creating little swatch squares and getting one print on one sheet of all the different sort of ranges that you can create a color palette and, uh, you know, to, to sort of take that as a tool and say, okay, I know I can produce this full scale uh, work and then recreate it on here with this sheet because this is the way it should look type of thing. I have a funny story so, about that. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So uh, an artist uh, wanted to test different papers and wanted to see how her, you know, wanted to kind of optimize her file. So she, she, she did just that. She created these uh, squares of various different solid colors. Yeah. Uh, because she had a print and it was kind of an abstract print. Uh, di of digital art, okay, mm. that she wanted to get uh, produced, okay, at, at, or that she needed to get produced uh, for a client. Well, she shows the client the square patches. The client thought that was the artwork and <laughs> ordered like a hundred prints of that. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't want the one that she was asking oh. for. <laughs> Well, it's a yeah. happy accident, I yeah. guess, right? You know, <laughs> as old as Ross used to say. Yeah. <laughs> One of those happy little accidents. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's great. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, I sort of akin to akin that, that information or that process to uh, uh, being in art school and, you know, learning painting and my instructor saying, okay, create, take pieces of canvas and do different things with it. And keep this sort of journal and dialogue of what you do with the acrylic or oil or whatever you're using on that surface. That's sort of what you're doing as well with your digital image is that you're recreating it, segments or pieces or portions of it on different types of paper to see what your end result's gonna be. Um, and that's a good way to also, uh, you know, keep as a sort of a journal in your studio. Um, hey, I did this once before, or you know what, I have a a thought or a concept that I want to recreate because, hey, I did this a while back two years ago and I have it here in my file and I'm going to do that. Um, and it could be your best work, you know, so you never know. Um, so uh, that's kind of everything I have for y'all. If there's questions on. We do have a question. I think it's going to go probably more to James. Um, we have David okay. Pearson, who is one of our geo gallery artists. Frozen. And he's Kind of done what you've said, Lewis. He's uh, he has printed on different types of paper, the uh, bamboo. He's uh, his watercolors have also translated well to the canvas. But he uh, he's printed on all of these different types of paper. He was wondering, James, is there a de a higher demand for any of the specific papers that we have? But I think the demand normally is dictated by maybe price rather than it. It, it is uh, demand is. You know, price probably is always going to <laughs> win. Uh, our, our most popular paper of all time is, is now, uh, and, and Lewis can comment on this, it, uh, it is our house stock, I call it. Uh, it's our archival matte paper. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually had that produced, private labeled for us. Didn't, right. Didn't, yeah. Um, uh, through Lewis. But it is the same as the Moab photo LaSalle, LaSalle matte. Matt. It's the exact same paper same manufacturer uh comes in the same box just with diff a different label right uh, yeah. <laughs> uh uh that is our most popular paper now that's an alpha cellos uh base up ba yes. base stock with mm -hmm. a uh uh has oba brightening mm -hmm. agents on it but as far as in demand okay and i i say in demand in demand as far as the most paper that we print on that is the highest demand but most requested uh, as far as, uh, and they might be for smaller volume, you know, people aren't printing, you know, a thousand prints on them, uh, but the most uh, requested was going to lie within our enemy line. The photo rag is the most popular uh, for, for 
for uh, you know fine art prints that are are you know like signed in number series where they're going to be be higher end prints. Um, uh, so the Hanamiel photo rag, and and it's not just for photography; it's also for for uh, uh, you know. You know, fine and, art, yeah, fine art, uh, art reproductions. The uh, the one next to it is going to be the Entrada rag. It looks exactly like the uh, uh, photo rag, and I cannot tell the difference between the two when <laughs> when we print them side by side. Uh, and that's a Moab product, yeah. okay. And the thing about that one, and 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 I I don't quite know why, but uh, the uh, photo rag. Even though it is a higher in-demand paper, it does have some OBA, uh, uh, OB, some brightening agents in it. Um, it hasn't really. There's been no indication that's really kind of hurt its uh, rating, you know, by third parties as far as its archivalness. But the uh, Intrada rag, on the other hand, is OBA free. So, uh, and that might be why it's, it's up there with the, with the demand. But the Hanumiel, pretty much the Hanumiel line in general is going to, is going to be where you're gonna find your, your more popular, that are more request, requested uh, materials. And, and uh, we, we do print on Hanumiel papers that we don't offer on our site when people order like a minimum of, you know, basically, there were pretty heavy volume where we'll, and usually it's from the Hanamiel line that people are requesting us to dedicate a whole roll of prints yeah. from. So I think uh, uh, popular wise, definitely agree with, with those two for sure off the bat. Um, the matte paper, because it's a bright white, uh, the uh, archival matte, uh, LaSalle matte, it's a bright white, it's a smooth surface. It's just got great consistency. Uh, the white point's really good, so it's gonna reproduce well. And it, it's, it's a very good sort of price point, point offering. Um, the photo rag through it for sure. Um, when I look at it, it it's a really good um, sort of like a workhorse paper. You know, it gives you sort of the best of both worlds. It gives you a smooth, semi-smooth surface with a little bit of tactility to it. Um, the finish on it, when I look at it and hold it in my hands, it's, it's very similar to a vellum finish. Um, so uh, vellum, not in as translucent or uh, vellum for like ar architecture drawings and stuff, like vellum in the commercial print world is a, a surface texture. It's a just a little bit of graininess on that surface to give you that haptic sense of tactility in there. So, um, What's nice about that is that you get a little bit of visual and surface texture experience, but then you get a really good consistent surface for the ink to uh, be presented. So I think that's the big reason why that particular item is gonna be a, a more popular one. It's very similar to uh, one of my favorite papers in the commercial world. So the white points like a balanced white, it's gonna give you a broader range of color sort of depth uh, between cool and warmer tones as well, um, without any issues of one overpowering the other. Uh, so that would be some one I would definitely think about. I was actually thinking about that, like what what would be probably my favorite sheet, and that would really yeah. kind of aligns it's, more into yeah, nice. what I would want. So um, uh, I think uh, so. One of the things too. So uh, other than the swatches that Finerworks provides, you know, um, you know. We, as a spec rep, you know, we go out into the market and we show swatch books of um, items to customers. Um, if James can't get y'all uh, a copy of like the Hunter Mule products, um, you can either go to their website and order them or, and they'll send you to uh, a rep close to y'all or, you know, y'all are more than welcome to email me and I can send one out. Same thing with the Moab swatch book and, um, maybe Kenson and the fine line swatch books. Uh, those are easy enough to get out, but uh, we can always get you in touch with the representative too that is in your area. Uh, but um, go to their websites and look at the materials and what they're doing. They've got usually got great blogs. Uh, James usually, you know, has a lot of information from them as well. 
uh, I think what they're doing here with their talks for education is excellent. Um, for Clampet paper, uh, we really pride ourselves on trying to educate the industry in our paper knowledge and experience. Um, and so it's always fun to do these talks and stuff. Um, one of the things, it's interesting enough that uh, they invited me to do this talk because I had a meeting last week and I don't think I showed this to James, but we just did a co-branded piece with um, a photographer, uh, Tad Myers. So I don't know if he's printed through or printed on your own, but the name sounds familiar. So uh, is he local? Um, I believe so. Uh, so Don Clampett in Dallas uh, created this co-branded sort of uh, promotional piece with Monadnock Paper Mills that kind of show the art of paper. And it's a little bit of portfolio of Tad Meyer's work. It's just a little four page brochure, but um, you know, in it, it gives a little story about you know, what he wants his work to represent and how he wants the image to be presented and, um, you know, the quality of materials, especially ones that are uh, environmental, have some um, environmental consciousness to it. And the Monadnock sheets on the commercial side, uh, one is on the uh, Astrolite PC100 Velvet, so 100% recycled sheet. And the other one is on the uh, Astrolite um, smooth 100% PC white. I don't know if y'all can see the surface difference, but this is sort of a coated and uncoated uh, surface oh, here. Let me see here. There you go. So this one up here, you can see sort of the sheen and shimmer on that. That's the coating. And this one down here is a little bit more matte. So that's sort of exactly what your print surfaces are gonna semi look like when you translate to um, you know, both commercial and uh, fine art digital printing on those different types of papers. So, uh, uh, yeah, well, gee, that, Lewis, thanks for, I mean, you really covered a lot of information. <laughs> yeah, I believe you were called a paper rock star in the, oh, yeah? the yeah. chat comments yeah. there. Oh. So, so, rock on. <laughs> and uh, yeah. we, um, we uh, James has I, got I, something special for everybody watching uh, yeah, toward the end here. So yeah, before, before I go to that, I, I did want to mention that, uh, and, and I kind of alluded to it earlier, uh, that uh, there there's a lot of papers out there that we don't offer on the Moab line, on the Hanimer line, on the Canson line, and there's papers we can get. All, and so if, if there is a paper that we don't offer that you really want us to, to print on, um, we, we, we do require minimum, but uh, as long as we're utilizing the majority of a full roll of that paper, uh, uh, we can work with you. So you'll, you'll, you know, so if there's something out there that you want us to print on, and, and we've done it in the past on certain animal papers, we say, hey, Lewis, we, we have a customer that wants, you know, uh, you know, prints on this particular animal paper. Uh, uh, Lewis will get that roll for us so we can uh, make sure, make it happen. So it's, uh, so again, if there's a particular paper that you have absolutely have to have, and you are doing enough prints on it, we can work with you on that. Um, and then uh, the other thing I want to say is that uh, uh, for everyone watching, uh, uh, we are offering uh, a 30% off on all our fine art papers uh, for the next two weeks and th uh, through uh, February 16th. Um, the promo code uh, is, so if you want to write this down or, uh, or just watch this, you know, scroll to the end of this uh, video once it gets off the live format. Yeah, put it in the comments. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. What was that code? I, I lost the code. Do you have the code? Yeah. Is it the one I sent you? <laughs> yeah. I, I forgot okay. what it is. Okay. It's uh, Y as in Young, T as in Tom, F as in Frank. Uh, e as an Edward B, as in boy, then 21. So YT Feb 21, as in February 2000. Yeah, as in YouTube, February 20, you know. Uh, oh, okay. I just wonder what the YT was. Okay. The code there is you go, YouTube. <laughs> so we knew where everybody was coming from on it. Right. Um, so that, that's good for the next two weeks. Uh, if you have any issues with using that, uh, contact our customer service team, they'll, they'll make sure they can help you out with that. Um, 
Uh, and so uh, I don't know, is there any? Yes, we got some closing things. Thanks for again watching all the way to the end. Uh, our first week of the month at Final Work is basically our live week. Um, Thursday, we have Jim Landers who will be uh, doing a photo tips monthly and we'll be talking about blur the background. Um, and this is great even for, you know, artists that are doing this uh, because you got to think about your social posts, guys. Um, not only, you know, for th these photo tips are not only great for photographers who want to, you know, add to their toolbox, but for artists that want to go ahead and have social posts and have a nice picture of your uh, artwork so that it gets shared. I have a friend who is sharing their sketches that they're doing in Starbucks and they've had them shared through Starbucks because the way they blurred and position and thing and it has gotten them a lot of prints. So um, this is, these are some photo tips you'll want to join in with us on the first, and we have that the first Thursday of the month. Um, next month, like for the first Tuesday, uh, we will actually be talking about framing tips and we're going to be covering everything from uh, the thickness of the width of your frame for different sizes, doing float framing, uh, different styles. Uh, so we'll have some tips on there for you guys that want to do uh, add framing to your inventory or have something framed up because the shows are coming back. Um, I'm already seeing a couple of things uh, in March popping up for art shows and art fairs. So um, that's, that's the, like I said, that's the upswing on everything. So we want you to join us back here uh, next month and join us here Thursday for Jim Landers and uh, get some tips on, on doing that. And, um, and Sarah, uh, again, it's going to be YT as in Tom, like YouTube, like YT, YouTube, Feb, F-E-B, 2-1. That's the code, YT, F-E-B, 2-1. That'll get you 30% off to the 16th. So uh, I wanted y'all to have that code. I'm glad James was able to put that together so y'all can try all of our paper samples and, and try out some of your stuff on there and see how you like them. Um, and don't forget, we also have the 50% off, uh, sale going on that ends tonight. tonight. Yeah, I mean, and, uh, and, and no, you can't use both codes, I believe, right, James, you can only use one code no, no, for order. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> so just yeah. put your order, so order, order your, uh, 50% off tonight and go ahead and, uh, the YouTube and uh, let's see, Michelle, yes, the expiration date of An this email on YouTube that. Yeah, we is them together. <laughs> That's how we do it. <laughs> the expiration on our YouTube Feb 21 code is going to be um, the 16th, Mich uh, Michelle. So you have to the 16th. Uh, James has it active now and it expires on the 16th. It's only two weeks to use it. Uh, so, um, so go through the papers there. Uh, those of you who have your uh, sample kit, um, same thing, go onto our, um, onto our website. You can order a sample kit that will give you all of the papers so that you can feel in your hands and look at the brightness of those uh, next to each other. And we want to thank Lewis again for doing this, the paper rock star for uh, being thank on you. here, answering our yeah. questions. And uh, Thanks, if thanks, have, thanks to everybody. Yeah, and if y'all have any questions, uh, you can watch us immediately uh, for playback on our YouTube channel. So it's really important that you subscribe and hit notify on there. So that way you're able to see all of these um, when they come up. And if you have any questions, just put them under that video. I'll get them. Or you can email me, melissa at finalworks.com. And I can relay any messages to James and to Lewis here. So with that, is that all you guys have to? Or is everybody ready to kind of do their goodbye? I think, I think that's <laughs> it. So appreciate y'all's okay. time. Thank you everybody for watching and being part of our uh, our live audience. We definitely appreciate it. Yes, thank you guys. I'll and have a good this, night. you being host, you just go down to the bottom and hit end and end end call for everybody.